God's word to you and me is found in Colossians 1, 24 through 29. We're continuing on with that series on Colossians. Listen to the word of God. Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you and fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in all its fullness. And the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you'd speak to us to, through your word. Pray that you'd use the words of my mouth to be an encouragement to the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today we're addressing the question of what does it mean to be spiritually mature? What does it mean to have spiritual maturity? To get a handle on this, I thought we'd talk about what it means to be chronologically mature. Uh, for a long time in America, if you were 18 years old, you were considered an adult. And those of you with 18-year-olds, you, you might, may not be sure about that. <laughs> but at 18 years old, you can vote. You can, uh, you can get a driver's license, although here in Delaware, at 16, you can have a driver's license. I'm really looking forward to when that circle goes in front of the high school between it and the moorings and see how that works with 16-year-olds and people mixing it up. That should be exciting. You can, uh, if you break the law as an 18-year-old, you'll be tried as an adult. You'll be judged that way. Um, at 18 years old, you're considered to have a certain amount of maturity, that you've reached an age where you can be responsible. But not everybody feels that way. Uh, you cannot, uh, you can't, insurance companies and rental car companies, my, my daughter found this out last summer, is you cannot rent a rental car until you're 25 years old. And the reason, there's a reason for this, I knew this, having worked in insurance a long time ago, but neurologist and psychiatric studies have shown that um, young adults are still prone to taking dangerous risks until they're about 25 you think that's true? Some of you have known some 25 years. But, uh, one study found that a 20-year-old is 50 times more likely to do something very risky, especially if they have one or two friends watching. It's interesting um, that, that that's where they're at. Cognitively, women to be, tend to be two years ahead of men in brain development. Some of you are smiling. We do catch up eventually. Several studies show that men, this one I don't know about this, but they said, I've seen this several places. They said, men t tend to reach full emotional maturity at age 43. <laughs> do you think that's true? So if you're a single woman, you want to get that 43-year-old guy because he's finally arrived. He's ready to settle down. Women tend to reach emotional maturity at age 33. It must be women who've done all these studies, I think. Um, young people today are moving into maturity and responsibility at a bit slower than they were in 1980. 1980, for those of you, for me, I think of 1980, well, it's like practically yesterday, but actually 1980 was... 44 years ago. And so listen to what the Pew uh, Research found. They said in 2021, 68% of 25-year-olds were living outside the home. In 1980, 84% had moved out of their homes and were living on their own. It's a substantial difference. I, I think the expectation back in 1980 were a bit more, hey, when you finish high school, you got to get out of here. That, that, when I was a kid, that, that was the expectation. You can't stay here. You better find something to do with yourself. 
Um, in 2021, 22% of uh, 25-year-olds were married. 22% of 25-year-olds were married in 2021. In 1980, 68% of 25-year-olds were already married. That's a, the effects on the culture are enormous. Uh, how we've changed in the last 44 years. In 2021, 17% of 25 year olds had children. In 1980, close to 40% were already parents. The speed at which young adults move into the next stage of life has slowed considerably. Now, more kids are going to college today than they were in 1980. Um, the cost of living has gone up tremendously uh, since 1980. And we're living longer. So it's like, well, if you're going to live to be 85 or 90, well, 25, you're still a child. Enjoy life. Put things off. And we see that, that uh, a lot of young men particularly are putting off marriage till about 28 to 30 years old. And so there's been a shift in, in how people think. As parents, our desire is that our children mature and become self-sufficient and launch their lives out into the world. That, that's our goal, is that we raise them up. They, they know how to make a living. They know how to handle themselves. They know how to pay their bills. They know how to take care of themselves, and we send them out into the world. And that, that's how it's supposed to work. Some marry, some don't. I mean, some are called to singleness. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus was single. St. Paul was single. Um, but just as we desire our physical children to become mature in the physical world, St. Paul's desire for new followers of Jesus was to become spiritually mature. And a new follower of Jesus has nothing to do with chronological age. I've led men to Christ, and I've shared this before. I've, over the years, over the, you know, 30-some years of ministry, I've led men to Christ who were 82. And so I've had 82-year-old new Christians, new believers. On the other hand, I've known people who were 27 or 28, and they gave their life to Christ when they were five to six years old, and they've been believers for 20-some years, and they've grown in Christ during those years. And so you can even have mature Christians who are in their late 20s. So age has nothing to do with it. But listen to Paul's desire for these new believers and believers who were further along in the church at Colossae. Verse 28, Paul says this. He says, He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present you fully mature in Christ. This is the goal of the church with regard to believers. Our goal is that everyone who's in the church become mature in the Lord, that we grow in our faith as much as is possible until the Lord takes us home or the Lord returns. You never reach a certain mark and say, oh, I'm mature. I, I, think I can stop growing in Christ now. That will never happen as long as you have breath in your body. We're called to grow in our faith. And so spiritual maturity is that's what the church is, in the, is in, the, in the business of doing, bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ and then helping them to become mature in their character, to become like Christ. Rick Warren put it this way, spiritual maturity is becoming like Jesus in the way we think, feel, and act. And the more you develop Christ-like character, the more you'll bring glory to God. The Bible says, as the Spirit of the Lord walks within us, we become more and more like him and reflect his glory even more. Oswald Chamber reminds us, spiritual maturity is not reached by the passing of years, but by obedience to the will of God. I've known people who gave their life to Christ at a very young age and never grew up in the Lord. They're still babies in Christ after 40, 50 years of knowing the Lord. They never never grew up. And that's not what we want. We want to grow up as Christians. So today I want to look at what does spiritual maturity look like? If this is 
one of the primary goals of the church, we need to look at, okay, what does spiritual maturity look like? How do we know if, if, we, if we're doing what we're supposed to do? Um, what does the finished product appear to be? Whenever I do a jigsaw puzzle, I always put the picture of the puzzle right in front of me so I know this is what it's supposed to look like when it's done. So I know these colors go here around the edge. This is, these are the flat edges. Here's this piece of the picture. Here's, this goes up here. And so, you know, as we work on bringing people to spiritual maturity as a church, whether you're an elder, a deacon, or your Bible study leader, your discipler, you need to say, what does it look like if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing? First, let's talk about the context of where spiritual maturity takes place, the context where we grow up to be like Christ, the context for growing to physical and emotional maturity physical and emotional maturity is the family that you grew up in. It's where you were fed. It's where you're taught wrong from right. It's where you were um, schooled, taught you, sent you to school, taught you how to learn things and about the world. Uh, it's where you're medically cared for. Uh, it's where you grew up and then were launched out. The context for spiritual maturity and growing up in Christ is the church. It's the church. Jesus brought the church into the being. We just read the last couple of weeks that Christ is the head of the church and the church is his body. It's his visible representation on the earth. The church is the organization where Christians live out their Christian life. St. Paul tells us that his high calling in Christ is above all to the church. When I first graduated from Virginia Tech and I started thinking about full-time ministry, I thought, you know, I'd like to be in crew or Young Life or InterVarsity, do one of these parachurch organizations. And I talked to my pastor and he says, he made a good point. He said, you know, Christ didn't form the parachurch, he formed the church. The church is central, the church is primary, not these other organizations. And I said, that's a good point. And that, that steered me towards ministry in the church. Paul says in verse 25, I have become a servant of the church by God's commission. The church is the place where we fully learn the God, learn about God. It's the, where the mysteries of God are revealed to believers. In Acts 2, it's the context for fellowship. It's where we get to know one another and encourage one another. Uh, it's where we minister to one another. It's the base from which the gospel goes out into the world. And so to be a follower of Jesus means to be in a local church. Being a Christian is not a, a solo thing where it's, it's not a do-it-yourself deal like everything else in America. Being a Christian means being part of the body of Christ, a local body of Christ where you're plugged in and you're encouraged and you're growing and you're, you're learning to fellowship with other believers. It's like the Lord's greenhouse. Have you been to a greenhouse before? It's early in the early spring or maybe even in winter. They'll go and they'll plant these seeds inside the greenhouse and that greenhouse will warm it up. It's where they're fertilized and watered and those tiny little seeds grow up into little plants and they keep nourishing them until they grow to full size and then they're ready to, to, to bear fruit. And that's what the church is. We're God's greenhouse in many ways. So what does spiritual maturity look like? And as a church, what are we aiming for in the life of believers? St. Paul gives us the context for the goal of spiritual maturity. He says spiritual maturity is his goal as, as the, a servant of the church. So to get at what does it mean to be spiritually mature, I want us to look at 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. You can turn there in your Bibles if you'd like, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7, or you can listen along. I'm going to read it for you. He says this, for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. 
This isn't the only place where the Bible talks about spiritual maturity, but I think it gives us a good glimpse of what it, of what it might be. So we're going to focus in on this. The starting point for everybody is to be a disciple first. Before you can be spiritual, spiritually mature, you must give your life to Christ. That's believing that he's the son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins and was resurrected. And you personally agree to be Jesus' follower. You can do this through prayer. You, you know, when I was a kid, you had to walk down the aisle in the Baptist church, walk down the aisle and profess in front of everybody. We have communicants class in the Presbyterian church. But at some point, you had to cross that line and say, I'm leaving the darkness. I'm coming into the light. I'm going to commit myself to Jesus. And when you did that, you started the, you started the beginning of discipleship, the process of becoming mature in the Lord. On top of faith, you, you begin with faith. I mean, Paul says this over and again, everything, the foundation is faith in Jesus Christ. He said this in 1 Corinthians. But on top of faith, he said, add goodness. Now, goodness, you know, when I think of goodness, I, I hear people exclaiming, oh my goodness, you know, when something bad happens. But I think a better translation, I like the King James, which is an old-fashioned English word, which is virtue. Add virtue. Now, the Holy Spirit transforms us, but Peter says, make every effort. We're partners with God in reaching spiritual maturity. So do your part, uh, cooperate with the Holy Spirit. So what is goodness or virtue? According to the dictionary, it's conforming to the standard of right or standard of morality. It's moral excellence to become spiritually Mature. The first step is to work towards having my life conform to the moral law of God. I say I'm a Christian, then somebody should be able to look at my life and say, oh yeah, the way he speaks, the way he acts, the way he lives his life. Yeah, that, it, it seems to match up with who he says he is as a follower of Jesus. I cannot be a a mature follower of Jesus and at the same time be cheating people out of their money. If I run a business and I'm cheating people out of their money and I say, yeah, I'm a mature Christian, people should look at me and say, well, maybe you are. Maybe not. Maybe you don't understand what it knows, really means to know Jesus. If I'm a devoted follower of Jesus, then filthy words and dirty jokes can't be part of my vocabulary. It's, I'd never said it would be easy. <laughs> When I was 13 or 14 years old, I said, you know, I, I, I had to make up my mind. I'd given my life to Christ as a small kid. But at 12, 13, 14, I said, you know, I need to get serious about this. And one of the things that had to change is I had a foul mouth. I used four-letter words. I loved to cuss. Just got real pleasure from it. And I had to stop it. One of the hardest things I've ever done. But in my mind, my young teenage mind, I thought, this is not pleasing to the Lord. If someone were to hear me at school cussing away, and then I say, yeah, I love Jesus, they might say, well, maybe not. To be a mature Christian, I, I've got to work on that short temper, if that's my thing. If I blow up every time I get angry, people are going to look at my life and say, wait a minute. And remember, you know, as we're talking about these things, I want to remind us you're saved by grace. We're not working for our salvation here. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. That's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. What we're talking about is after you've been saved, after you've been redeemed by God, then we're working to become more like Christ. And that's not earning our salvation. It's I love Jesus so much that I want to please him with the way that I speak, with the way that I talk, with the way that I live out my life. Um, and so we need to know what God desires and, and to choose with the help of the Holy Spirit to do the right thing. Now, to know what God desires of us in our thoughts and behavior, we must be students of God's word. So St. Peter says, on top of, of uh, 
conforming to the, to, to, to the Lord on top of virtue, add knowledge. Add the knowledge of Christ's teaching and the word of God to your intellect and also to your heart. Not just, we don't just want head knowledge here, but we want heart knowledge. Knowledge that, that springs from a heart that is committed, not only just, not only that knows information, but is committed to living it out. And we do that, we, we get that knowledge about what God desires for us, but we're doing it now. We're attending worship, you're listening to preaching. You go to Sunday school, you join a life group, you, you, you go to a, a, a Bible study, or you read God's word all on your own. And virtue and knowledge go hand in hand. On top of these, St. Peter says to add self-control. That's difficult, isn't it? To control your, your natural urges and desires. To, to not eat the extra donut tomorrow morning when you stop by the bakery. To, uh, to be careful with what you feed yourself. To be careful to, to be in control as you're going down Route 1 and you get cut off by the, the people on their way to New Jersey or New York and they're in a hurry and they cut you off and what comes out of your mouth after that happens? Are you in control of yourself? What do you think? Listen to Proverbs 25, 28. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. A person without self-control is already defeated. There's a big gap so the enemy can come right in and wreck your life. Anyone who lacks self-control, if you lack self-discipline with your temper, you won't have many friends, and I've known people who've lacked self-control with their temper and their marriages have been a mess. If you can't control your spending, you'll soon be broke. I remember one lady in my first church, um, she'd passed away. We went to her home, and um, there must have been three or four hundred open boxes, unopened boxes from the shopping channel. She just spent and spent and spent and never opened anything up that she'd bought. A, a, a little bit of an addiction and a lack of self-control with the credit card and, and with spending. If you're out of control sexually, your relationships will be disastrous. We're, we're seeing unbelievable stuff uh, coming our way in terms of the sexual revolution right now. And it, for Christians, man, we've got to discipline ourselves so we don't get sucked into that. We have to discipline ourselves with digital communication or, and, and social media. I know people, they spend their whole day scrolling through social media or YouTube videos and stuff like that, and you never get anything done. You get addicted to it. Training our physical and emotional impulses and urges is, discipline, is difficult. And we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So we ask God to help, and we keep his word in our heart, and we practice self-discipline day by day with little steps. Tomorrow, I'm going to be careful with my words. Tomorrow, I'm going to be careful with, I, with what I eat. Tomorrow, I'm going to control my temper. I'm going to do it for one day. And then if I make it through one day, I'm going to do it another day. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask the Lord to help me through this every time. To self-discipline, we're to add perseverance. The dictionary defines it as steadfastness in the course that you've chosen. It's not quitting when every bone and muscle of your body screams for you to give up. I don't, it doesn't look like it, but Laura and I, when we were in our 20s, we used to do road races. I'm not made for running at all, but I, I was in love, so I did it. And, and after about mile number four, I'd get a cramp or something. I'm like, I got to sit down. And my wife would say, no, you're not. And I'd keep going, but it, it killed me. I wanted to sit down. Um, perseverance means you keep going, even when it hurts, even when you don't feel like it. The Christian life is more like running a 26-mile marathon than it is a 100-meter sprint. 
It's a lifetime of steadfastness, of not giving up, of remaining faithful. It's a lifetime effort. It, it's a task that we work on until we die or Jesus takes us home or he comes again. When life gets hard, uh, when we have serious failures, you're going to be tempted to quit. You get sick. Someone else gets sick and dies. You lose your job. Your children go sideways. Um, you, you run into despair. You're alone. The temptation will be to quit and give up. Don't do it. Don't do it. This is not... This is not a sprint. This is a race. This is a long-term race. Don't give up even when you take a hard fall. Get up and keep walking with the Lord. If you've messed up morally, confess your sin to the Lord. Ask the people you've offended to forgive you. Dust yourself up. Get back on your feet and keep walking with the Lord. And a lot of people, when they fail morally or otherwise, the first thing they want to do is, you know what they do as a pastor? I've seen happen. They disappear from the church. Because in their heads, they're getting neurotic and they're saying, I'm the only one in that, I'm the only one in that sanctuary who's ever failed like me. And you know what I know? You're in a room full of failures. Because <laughs> we're all sinners. And we've all taken a hard fall at one time or another. So if you come in here and you're feeling like you're all by your lonesome, the only one who's ever goofed up or had a hard fall, let me tell you, you are not alone. In fact, if you do the unthinkable and you actually talk about it, I remember my son, he got detention. So I had a 6 a.m. Bible study on the day he had detention. I said, son... The only way I can get you to, to your detention beforehand is you're going to have to go to Bible study with me at 6 a.m. So we got up at 5 and went to Bible study. And these old guys all in their 60s, 70s, and 80s were sitting around the table and said, oh, your son's here with you. Why is your son here? I'm like, he's got detention. And then they all told their stories about how they had detention. I'm like, you're not helping here. <laughs> But you know what? He felt better. He said, good golly, if that 85-year-old guy sitting across from me had several detentions, I guess it's okay if I got in trouble once. I said, yeah. Yeah, it sure is. We're all sinners. We're all needing forgiveness. It's a long-term thing. On top of perseverance, we're to add godliness. Godliness springs from that devotion to God. For the godly person, its personal worship is central to their lives. They're, a godly person is drawing near to the Lord, desires to be in the presence of the Lord. And they start seeing the world as the Lord sees it. That's what a godly, what godliness is. Someone who's near to the Lord and sees the world as the Lord sees it. The highest level of spiritual maturity is found in those followers of Jesus who develop the discipline of loving their fellow believers and also loving those outside the church walls. They have mutual affection for their fellow believers. They've learned to be patient and kind and gentle with their brothers and sisters in Christ. They've learned how to forgive. They've learned how to put others ahead of themselves to not always demand their own way. This kind of love does not come naturally. You know, as a church, we're from all kinds of places. Some of us are from New York, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland. Some of you are even from Delaware. And, um, and we all see the world quite differently. And the only way we're going to be the church is if we love each other deeply from the heart. And sometimes you're going to have to let things go. If someone steps on your toe and it, as long as they didn't break it, you're going to have to say, you know what, I'm just going to let that go. I'm not going to make a capital offense out of it. Hey, I'm going to forgive. Hey, I'm, I'm angry at what this person did, but I'm going to be patient with them anyway. Hey, I'm going to forgive even though my feelings were hurt. 
It's the only way we're going to hold together as a church if we have people in the church who have that kind of spiritual maturity, who love each other deeply from the heart, willing to forgive, willing to love. And, it, and it, this is learned behavior. And let me tell you, when someone stomps on your foot or it, it rubs you the wrong way, you're not going to feel like loving them. You know that, right? So when you love them, you're going to have to love through your actions by not putting a big frown on your face and getting in their face and, and avoiding them. You're going to have to do what does not come naturally, which is go up to them and be kind and forgiving. And that's learned behavior. And you're going to have, if you wait till you feel like forgiving somebody, you won't forgive them. You're going to have to do it even if you don't feel like it. And the feelings will follow. Actions first, feelings follow. That's what I found anyway, my personal experience. We're going to have to be deliberate about this. The last characteristic is the love for those in darkness. Non-believers. A love for our enemies. Uh, when we reach this level of maturity, we, we've learned to, to see others as Jesus sees them. We've learned to Christ, Christ's command to love those who hate us. And there's people who hate us. They hate what we stand for. They hate that we say that there is actual truth. We hate that we say that they hate that we say Christ is the only way to salvation. They hate us for that. Um, they don't like us. And, and we've got to learn one of the what brings us to spiritual maturity is to love these people, to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile. You know, when someone hurts me and is mean to me, I, my immediate natural reaction is, how can I get even? And Christ says, no. No, I don't want you to get even. I want you to love that person who stomped all over you, who's been mean to you. And there's a reason they're that way. When we're loving people outside the church, the re they're acting naturally. They're, they're unreformed. They're un Trans they're not transformed. They're outside of Christ and they have that natural self. And you and I have to see them that way and see that hateful person as someone that God loves and wants in his kingdom. And that, that takes some maturity to view non-believers that way. Let me wrap up with this. We will not arrive at complete spiritual maturity until Christ takes us home or a second coming. Uh, we don't earn salvation by being good. Salvation and forgiveness are free. But the Lord desires that we grow spiritually, becoming like him every year in character in the way that we live. And the Holy Spirit brings this about supernaturally, but we're not robots. We don't have to obey the Holy Spirit. I've known people that have been Christians for 50 years, and they're just as immature as when they first accepted Christ. Because they refused the urging of the Holy Spirit. They've refused to put into practice the Word of God. And so you and I, we have to be careful that we don't get stuck as immature Christians, that we don't stay there. We've got to say, take a look in the mirror and say, am I becoming more like Christ? And if not, what am I going to do about it? As a church... We encourage spiritual maturity. That's the goal that Christ has for our church, for those outside of the Lord. Um, and for, peop well, for people in the church, we have the goal of bringing spiritual maturity. For those outside, it's to bring them to faith in Christ. So we have two goals, to make the gospel known, and for people who know Christ in the church, is to bring them to spiritual growth and to maturity in the Lord. As individuals, we strive to become more like Christ day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. I have two book recommendations if you want to read further on this. One is In Pursuit of Maturity. It's by a guy named J. Oswald Sanders. It's an older book, but I found it pretty helpful. And then the second one is The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. It sounds, it sounds like holiness, but it's, he's really saying, how do I conform my life to Jesus? And that's what we want to do as believers. That's, that's, that's the journey for us, is to become more like Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for your love for us. Pray that 
you'd help us to, to be more like you. And as a church, I pray for our elders and our deacons and our Bible study leaders that we would keep that goal in mind of bringing people to maturity in you. And like Paul, I pray that we'd put our energy and every effort into bringing people into conformity to Jesus Christ. It's his, his name we pray. Amen.